Greetings, fellow investigators, and welcome back to our video podcast, Into the Darkness, where my friends and I play the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. I'm your host, Tom Rayleigh. The campaign is Horror on the Orient Express. It's available from Chaosium. I am the Game Keeper, and this is episode 10. Our recap will be given by John Hook as his character, Dr. Edison York. So without any further delays, let's continue our journey into the darkness. John? Dear Jerry, I find myself traveling across Europe aboard the Orient Express, and you would expect only the finest of accommodations and the luxury of travel across this beautiful nation. But something strange has occurred. It's hard to describe. My companions and I awoke from a dream within a dream, something bizarrely known as the Dreamlands, where we boarded another train, some kind of monstrous beast that walked across those strange plains. It's very odd indeed. While aboard, I found myself playing chess with a, with a Russian it was very interesting. I did not win, but it was interesting to meet new people. If it was even real, it's so hard to say. It's very confusing. One of the interesting things aboard this train is some kind of clay, something called vert that, according to the story told aboard by the... Uh, chef de train if we form this clay into a symbol something that we wish to cast aside it could be thrown into a great gulf and according to legend that that thing that you were uh I, creating with the icon will be cast aside as you know from my time in the war when that boat was struck and we nearly drowned. I have a deep fear of dark, deep waters. So in my dreams, I'm trying to form the shape of a fish that I could toss in and relieve myself of that fear of, of water, but we'll see. It's just something to do in a dream. You, as you do in dreams, you, you go with it, but we shall see. We met a few of the other passengers as well, besides the Russian. We found some uh, uh, interesting things in the observation car, some hidden chambers, very odd. And, and the great beast that, that is the train itself is comprised of all these writhing tentacles that do all of the work on board, serving dishes, producing meals, giving drinks, anything you need. It truly is a dreamland for sure. But it was very strange indeed. It was interesting. In fact, the uh, Russian has something as bored as well. I, I'm forming a, a fish, but according to the chef de train, there's some kind of large box that's chained almost like a coffin that belongs to Karakov. It'd be interesting if he ever gets relieved of that. But, and I can't even describe the horrors of the engine and how it is stoked, how the fires of this beastly engine is stoked and the, 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 creatures the nightmarish creatures that that work the the coal car and keep it keep those fires going it's it's very strange indeed our train is arriving in some kind of town known as dilathleen <laughs> i don't know what to make of this i think perchance i shall sleep some more and maybe destroy this letter
Okay. Uh, question then for Dr. Edison. Are you writing the letter in your dream? I did. Um, uh, Henry informs you all that uh, it's about 10 o'clock. You will, 10 o'clock in the evening, you'll be arriving in Dilathlin in about half an hour. And he advises you once again, if you want to go into the town, stick together, don't go out and down any dark alleys, uh, and be careful because the waterfront bars can be rough. Uh, you're going to be there for a, about two hours, I believe. This seems like a long enough time to uh, look around and see what the non-mobile part of this realm is like. Oh, yeah. I, I agree. I, I doubt that I'd ever get another chance to see, see the city. I wonder if there are any rules. I mean, we have been eating and drinking on the train. But, you know, there are, in mythology, there are always stories if, if Persephone eats the pomegranate in Hades, for example. I wonder if there are any things that we should avoid of this nature. I suppose we could ask Henri. Yeah. Oh, we miss you. Don't drink any of the moon wine. Mm, that's that extremely, extremely specific. Extremely potent. Extremely potent, and it is often used by those uh, red turbaned, black masked creatures to hijack people and uh, how do they say Shanghai them out into the uh, into the abyss where they come from? All right. Uh, go ahead. Yes. Well, we we shouldn't go too far into the city. We we don't want to we don't want to get lost or uh, detained. But stretching our legs and taking a, a little look around seems like a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I, if we go, we all need to go together just for safety. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. All right. So after a half an hour or so, um, after a half an hour or so, um, out the window, you see this, you're, you're coming towards it. Um, Dilathleen is a port city. Imagine, if you will, um, uh, shaped kind of like a large crescent. Um, the back part of the crescent are, is composed of cliffs and hills and things like that with houses built on them going up. And the center of the crescent is the cove the bay where these ships come in and that opens out towards the sea um the uh, the cove is all wharfs uh there are numerous uh ships uh all parked there all of them uh, sailing ships uh all of their uh, rigging tied down and their uh, their uh, their sails uh furled closed um you uh, the, the train itself, since uh, Mimi doesn't really have a track that she follows, except that she tends to follow the same path. And about the only way you can tell is the grass has been kind of mashed down a little bit. Um, she comes up towards the side where, where one of the arms of the crescent comes down. And it's at the end of the long wharf that goes along the, the inside of the crescent. Uh, it's actually been built up so that when she pulls up next to it, uh, you don't have to have a ladder going down. You just have a gangway that goes across to the wharf. Um, she pulls in parks there, and you see immediately she begins to unload stuff from her, you know, her compartments and uh, picking stuff up off of the, the dock that's been placed there. And there are some workers there that are they're used to it. So um, you are, of course, so welcome to go across. The city's actually uh, quite lovely. I mean, from this, from that point of view, you're seeing this dark town at you know, 1030 or 11 o'clock at night, uh, but there are lanterns everywhere up in, up throughout the city. 
Um, you can see that there is a large structure up on the cliff itself, which is probably the castle or the palace of, uh, uh, Henry tells you the vizier who uh, mm -hmm. is in charge of the place. Uh, the, uh, uh, the smell of salt air and fish uh, hits your nose as you uh, step onto the gangway or, or even if you're on the observation platform and you can hear the faint din of laughter and music and probably fighting uh, going on in the, the wharf, the, the pubs along the wharf. And you said there's quite a few people walking around too. Yeah. What would you all like to do? Uh, well, as I start walking out, I kind of shake my head and it's like, ah, what a time to be without my camera. It's like, what an image uh, to have captured. But, yeah, I think we might be better off with a mental camera as I don't expect that anything you photographed here you can develop in waking life. It's true, but uh, it just feels so so strange not to have it on me visiting a new city. Perhaps we can buy a camera in the village. There's a bazaar or something in this town and we can see if what we can return to waking life with. Do you think they, they would have cameras, Roland? I mean... Everything seems so primitive. It does. I, and yet, uh, for example, it is not difficult on, on board the train to uh, receive an espresso. This is a steam technology, roughly similar in era. I wouldn't be surprised if the optics here were good. It just doesn't seem very technological. Yeah, maybe a camera would be a tiny bird inside a box that would peck out a picture on a piece of stone. Oh, what imagination. <laughs> it seems a dream uh, solution to a dream problem. Dreams, a dream solution. Uh, Edison is in his uh, quarters and is dressing. And uh, one of Edison's uh, passions is uh, horseback riding. And, you know, I normally like to, Fidget, I guess. And so I, I miss my riding crop. And 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 I kind of, you know, I, I express that to myself out loud as I was in the wardrobe and pulling out, you know, a nice uh, jacket to stay warm and a cap, uh, like a riding cap. And I'm like, I wish I had brought my my riding crop. Is there any does the does the train provide? Do well. <laughs> I am the unluckiest man on the planet. I could have only rolled one number worse. <laughs> yeah, no, it, uh, nothing like that happens. Um, Just a stir stick. <laughs> hmm. No, yeah, but hmm. I mean, at the same time, you have all of the usual things that you can wear. Sure, yeah, I've got a waistcoat and a little right. cap and whatnot. Hmm. Well, shall we? Certainly. Yes, we shall. Might uh, might there be a, a walking cane or anything like that handy for uh, for shore leave? Um, if you need something like that, uh, Henry can provide it. Uh, mm. I, I he wouldn't have thought of it because. Okay. Oh, never mind. We, we won't need one. We're healthy and sturdy. Mm -hmm. Now, All as right. we as we descend down, are there like signs that like, oh, this way to the pub district, this way to the no, not plot? really. Okay, um, you're you're stepping. You you go across the gangway to the uh, to the wharf, and you step out onto the wharf. There's a few, as I say, there's a few workmen who are moving stuff, and then uh, Mimi is taking the stuff and putting it on the train, and she's exchanging it for various other goods that she has. Um, you notice at the end of the wharf, side to side, the, the other end of the wharf is, you know, maybe two miles down at uh, the other end of the crescent. Uh, you notice there are two gentlemen standing there and they seem to be dressed 
uh, in what you would guess is an, a, a, a uniform of some sort. Um, the predominant colors are brown and green, and each of them has emblazoned on their chest an eyeball sort of symbol that's there. Um, and they have little floppy hats. Uh, it's just everything in your instinct tells you that there's something like town guards or police or, or something like that. Uh, they, they have swords at their sides, uh, but they're not particularly being very attentive. They're mostly leaning a little on the railing and they're laughing at each other and telling each other stories and just keeping a half an eye on everything that's going on, uh, including you guys when you get off and We'll have to walk past them. Remind me, the, the tickets that Henri furnished us, we have those on our person, yes? Yeah. In fact, they kind of, they've kind of gotten to the point where if you just want to present it, it's there in your hand. Otherwise, it just, it's not there. No, I don't think about it. Oh, we, should, we should ask Hon, uh, Henri before we leave about money. Um, ah, monsieur, everything here is traded. So uh, most of the dreamlands function that way. Um, uh, Dilathleen is well known for jewel, the jewel trade. Ah. So you might not have any money uh, to trade. Uh, but then again, what is it that you need that I cannot provide? <laughs> uh, you That's... won't be able to take any trinkets uh, into the real world with you. At least not, not usually. Yeah, but if we were to enter an establishment of entertainment, uh, uh, not to drink the moon vine, but... Uh, um, I'm not sure. They might, uh, they might just want to hear a story or something. Uh, in true. fact, my simple ring also might be exotic here. Who knows? Perhaps. I will, I, I assume, still wake up with it when I'm on the train. It, is, it would be interesting to see if we have anything they want, I guess. Perhaps just to walk the streets, smell the smells, and get back to the train in a timely fashion will be fascinating enough. How soon, a, I, I'll ask Henri, how soon shall we return? Well, the train leaves in two hours, but I won't leave without you. Um, oh. If I'd, come, I'd come looking for you if I have to, but... Uh, you know, keep an eye on the, the time. Hmm. We have a well, watch. Here. How do we do yes. that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, you should be able to kind of tell when, you know, two hours have gone by or less than two hours have gone by. So it's not a clock uh, tower in Dilletlin? There might be. Yeah, there probably is. We'll say there's a, a tower with a clock on it. Clocks have been around for long time. Hundreds of years. If it had four sides and they said the same, same thing, I would be surprised, though. Uh, any sign, fellows, of the other three travelers? Or they perhaps are bored of the sport city? Uh, um, of course, the lady would not want to see any of the male people in this village. Oh, no. She was uh, very cold. Uh, you, don't see, you don't see any of them. Well, let me, let me give you a little. Okay, uh, the Russian fellow. Uh, he tells you that I am going to go to get a drink. I like to drink, so might as well. <laughs> and when you mention money to him, he's like, you don't have a trade here. You've just arrived, so you have no money. Don't, you know, I, I'll do what I can because I've, I've traveled before, so I have some... some uh, some things to trade. Uh, so you can go with him. He knows. Yeah. I know. I know where the, the good places to. Go. Yeah, we might wander off on our own after a bit, but certainly it would be interesting, as you are a gentleman of experience, to see what you know of this place. Right. Okay. So he uh, he walks with you. He's he's very sort of a merry sort of man. Um, he likes, he talks loud, uh, he laughs loudly. Hmm. Uh, 
But like I said earlier, there you, you have a feeling that he's kind of a person who's shrewd and he could turn that off if he wanted to. If he's into arms dealing, then perhaps it's all just a big show. But he um, he takes you down to the uh, the wharf and you pass a couple of places first. Uh, one's called the Sea Witch Tavern. Uh, there's the... Uh, captain's crow and then he finally settles on a place called banyan's day mm. and he said this, this is a good place uh it's kind of like being in an old west movie or or pirates of the caribbeans when you walk in the place is loud there are uh, people drinking people playing table games uh not so much cards but more like chess and checkers and things like that and um, there's a, 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 like a small ensemble of four people playing musical instruments, uh, which is oddly classical, uh, or at least rather classical sounding, a little less pirates than you expected. Uh, there are a number of, um, I guess you'd call them wenches that are serving people. Uh, the, a couple of the things that you begin to notice is the costuming for this town has a definite um, sort of Middle Eastern sort of feel to it. There's a lot of turbans, there's a lot of robes, there's a lot of uh, jingly bits on the serving ladies. Uh, it just has that sort of feel to it. And, Keeping an um, eye out for red turbans in particular. Right. You don't see any at this point in the bar. Um, if, if, if you'll allow me, you go in and you sit down. Um, and he orders some drink, you know, without really asking you what you like. He says it's a local, local, uh, local drink. And they bring it over to you. And it's kind of a, a, a purplish sort of hue to it, a little like an aviation. Um, and uh, it's got a rather strong alcohol -y sort of smell, a little like uh, uh, aquavit. And uh, to your lips, it's pretty strong. It's, uh, it's definitely a high proof of some sort. I'll take a, oh, a little sip of it. Um, I don't know. Maybe we'll make something up. Uh, he, he says it's called um, uh, Bleed not, Monkey. <laughs> not <laughs> Moon Wine. That was. No. <laughs> it's, uh, it's called Bleed whoop. the Monkey. Hmm. Interesting name, but. Uh... <laughs> Very, uh, very strong. It burns a little. Well, and he. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we are used to it, you know. So oh. um, you spend it... a little time with him, you know, 20 minutes or so, chit-chatting. And uh, he's like, well, I'm going to go back to the boat. I'm not really... Feeling the train like playing games or the, to the train, yeah. And uh, I will uh, see you all later. And off he goes, humming yeah. to himself, humming some little Russian hmm. tune. Uh, I would be interested to uh, walk up the hill a little bit and see the bay from higher up, just from geographic curiosity. Maybe we see something interesting on the way. I'm yeah, not. sure. Go back. So good. The wharf part of the town is fairly flat, uh, or it's kind of in levels. If you're down near the water, it's fairly low, and then there's maybe a higher, higher area and a higher area above that. But then it starts to become stairs going up to levels, you know, on the cliff side, and so forth. You can see the the vizier's. Uh, uh, I, I, it's not really a palace. It's more of a castle. It's not that big. Uh, the vizier's castle 
um, how is brightly lit. There's flames, you know, around it in uh, in braziers, and uh, there's light, and you can see quite a few of these uh, guards with the eyeballs here and there on them. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely some sort of town guards. They uh, they're occasionally walking the streets, uh, but when a fight breaks out in one of these bars and spills onto the street, they don't do much. They uh, pretty much step around it and keep going. Mm. So for town mm. guards, that they they're probably only after I don't know serious criminals or people who are violating the city law, whatever that that may be. So as you walk as their tabards seem to show they they're here to merely observe. And and through the course of <laughs> the evening, you learn they're called the eyes of Dilathleen. And that, hmm. that's pretty much their function. Um, Do most of the all, people in the town seem human? Uh, yeah, so far as you know, they all look fairly human. Um, a few odd looking people. And in fact, do a spot hidden. Not I. 98. I, I succeeded for what? Huh? 25. 53. I'm passing, kind of. As an 05, I have an extreme success. Okay. Um, so you've gotten to a place on a kind of a terrace. Um, oh, halfway up towards the castle. Um, you've got a lovely view looking down into the bay. Uh, you can see the moonlight reflected on the water and uh, the sailing ships all sort of gently rocking, you know, the, their masts gently rocking in the, in, on the sea. And uh, you hear that, that den, you know, of stuff going on in the evening. Dr. Edison, as you're standing there, you notice over towards the side, There's somebody standing on the roof of a house. You think it's somebody. They don't seem to be moving, but at the same time, they're dressed in a kind of a black cloak. And the cloak sort of whips back behind them in the light breeze. And they, whoever this person is, he's also looking out towards the sea. Uh, he's not really near you, and you, you think at first it might be a fixture on the house, but then you see it move, you know, kind of back and forth. And those of you who passed, you also see it because you notice Dr. Edison looking at something huh. that's there. And since we're working our way up the, the cliff side, you know, we're, we're getting some elevation. Is this person standing on a roof? that is below our elevation, it's, equal to our elevation or above? It was above before, but now that you're moving up, it's now below. And he's not looking in your direction. He's, he's looking down towards the, the bay. And, and he's been there long enough for us to transition from being below to now being above. Right. So he's just been standing there like Batman, cloak furling, and he's yeah, looking out know. over the, uh, okay. Well, hmm. Yeah, look at this. Look at this guy. Hey. I wonder if he's one of these sentinels as well, these uh, eyes of dilathine. Could be, but he's, he's dressed different than the others. Maybe maybe, maybe he's maybe. watching uh, for uh, a ship to come in that uh, has been gone for a, a long time. Maybe, maybe. Maybe or, or smuggling, looking for some kind of ship, to, a smuggling ship. He Just certainly the, looks like he doesn't want to be seen, uh, other than the fact that he's standing on the roof. But I, you imagine that from down below, he would just be black against the sky. Dressed in, dressed in dark clothing. The building he's atop isn't uh, any different than any of the other buildings. It's not like a very particular building. It just looks like a residence or a, oh, okay. Yeah. But it, it's, it's odd in that it's an odd place for somebody to be standing. 
And this is quite a ways from here. They're not, it's just odd. But then again, it's dreams. So what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> it is. A, I wonder if he's getting ready to fly. No, wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> I think anything is possible here. So, <laughs> look, look at the beast that we, that we rode in on. In fact, from where you're standing, you can see um, over sort of, you know, once again, towards the point of the crescent, you can see Mimi all laid out there like a big caterpillar along the side of the wharf. Hmm. Yeah. So as we've climbed up, are there any more uh, buildings that are obviously like uh, public buildings that are like a bars or shops or, or is it more a residential area that we've It's almost in? all residential. Okay. And it's quiet and it's a little dark. There's less mm-hmm. street light activity up in this direction. I don't oh. know how far we should stray. Yeah, I mean, it's people's homes, and it, it is awfully late at night. Yeah. yeah. Also, it's kind of mazy. You're going up little stairs, down little roads, up other stairs, and on the terraces, up other stairs. Yeah, and this is a dream, so this this terrain might even change on us. So, gentlemen, be- what do you think about returning to Mimi? I think that's a excellent idea yeah, i think it's a good idea also good call. Yeah, i feel as though we have a sense of this place mm-hmm. yeah. so you walk back down the stairs it, it doesn't take you too long uh, you kind of figure if you just keep going in that general direction you'll eventually come out onto the wharfs and mm-hmm. find your way and in fact that does happen um the, the fellow on the rooftop he does he seem to pay any attention as we go beneath him well, you're not really, you're kind of way over to the side of where he is. Mm-hmm. Um, you weren't really that close to him. But at, if you look back, as you've gotten down much lower and look back, you're pretty sure he's still there. Um, hmm. Looking, now he's huh. kind of looking in your general direction, but you don't think he's looking at you. There's other people walking about. And why would he be looking at you for any reason whatsoever? Does in his silhouette do we see the hands or maybe uh, he, they would there. be this side probably yeah. under his cloak? Uh, it could be anything. That could be a religious practice here, or it could be the head of the eye, or it could be another dreamer. Yeah, mm. someone mm-hmm. just standing out on the balcony having a smoke. He does not look as though he's poised to leap to his death. However. He does not look as though he needs assistance. So let him be. So you get back uh, to the wharf. You go up to the, the gangway and cross it back onto the observation point, uh, observation platform on the back of Mimi, just as Henry appears. And uh, he has said, I'm, I'm told we're going to have some guests, a, de- um, a delegation from a number of from a couple of different towns, they have some dispute. We're not sure what it is, but they're going to be boarding in a few minutes, and uh, we're going to be taking them all the way to King Coranis in the course of traveling. Uh, mm. They're welcome to uh, to stay and watch. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. And he uh, he crosses the gangway and goes down to the. Uh, on the platform and he waits for a bit and you hear something that sounds like uh, music um, kind of sort of a, a, a tinny ancient sort of sounding music and this delegation of six people uh, they come walking up onto the platform and it's it's almost like uh, it's almost like you're watching some sort of a uh, an opera or a stage play as they are they're coming up. You're seeing their heads first, and then they're slowly walking up the stairs onto the platform. And 
there are three men and three women, and they are dressed in outlandish sort of costumes. Um, they're also pretty, you're pretty sure they're not human, at least not in your sense. Um, though they have head, arms, legs, bodies like yours, they look like they're very tall and mm -hmm. kind of silvery. Um, they look like they're at least seven feet tall, very thin. And uh, the three gentlemen are dressed in these, like I said, these sort of outlandish robes of bright colors and very silky uh, fabrics. And they have these funny little hats on their heads. Uh, their heads are like no other, you know, uh, hats that you've ever seen. Hard to describe, ridiculous, mm -hmm. prettily little things. Very ceremonial sort of looking hats. Each one of them is different. Their color combinations are completely different. And the ladies also are very tall and very aquiline, and very, um, very pretty. Uh, and they're, they're like something you'd see in an Erte, uh, if you're familiar with the artist, these long silky robes that trail onto the ground. And they sort of come forward. They're, they're in a group. Um, they're not acting particularly regal the gentlemen are rather dignified looking and the ladies are giggling and, and talking to them. They all look like they're probably in their 20s, like baby-faced. Um, they, uh, they move up to where Henry is and he sort of gives them a little bow and he says something, you can't really quite hear it. Um, and uh, motions for them to get on the gangway and uh, they begin walking towards you because you guys are right there on your thing. They move very gracefully, almost like they're floating, you know, like ballet dancers, they, they move. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you hear, they have voices that are very sort of, the, the ladies have lilting sort of uh, tinkly voices and the men have a more masculine, but still very graceful sounding voices, very smooth. Um, they move on to the observation platform and you can see they sort of are, a, they, they stay as a group. They glance over at you and a feeling, well, like a lot of people have in school. I hope that you understand what I mean. It looks like there's an inside joke as they're looking over at you. They titter to one another and, uh, one of the men laughs and they give you a couple of sideways glances and then they just move past you, you know, without saying hello or good evening or anything like that. And they move in towards the lounge area as they go by. Um, a few moments after that, a gentleman comes walking onto the platform who also looks quite alien um he is definitely kind of a silvery purple skinned individual and his eyes are just dead yellow there's no pupil no iris and they sort of glow slightly uh he's dressed in a rather actually kind of like you guys are in a very in a shirt and a suit um, he doesn't have a jacket, but he's got a waistcoat on, a double-buttoned waistcoat. And uh, Henry seems delighted to see him. And uh, there's an exchange for a moment, and you see the man reach into his pocket and pull out a little vial, yes, if you like this, a little vial um, of a bright green liquid. Um, looks like a little... Um, wine bottle and you can tell just by his body language that Henry is delighted. He's beside himself. He takes the wine bottle and puts his hand on the fellow and walks him towards the, the plank and uh, walks across with him to where you are. And uh, he says, oh, my friends, what, what a great experience this is. Uh, you wanted to see someone from a completely different world. This is Mr. Meronimer, mm. Monsieur Meronimer. 
is not from the earthly dreamlands. He is, in fact, from another world entirely called Sarub. He is Sarubian. Ah. And to his people, he is a wine merchant, and he has given us a gift uh, in order to travel on our train. Uh, and he shows you this bottle, uh, and he says, we will, we will sample it in a while, but uh, I still have one set of guests that I'm waiting for, uh, the other half of the delegation. Um, you saw the others. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's very charming. Um, well, the next guest, uh, and he, he turns to Merwan in there and says, uh, you know, if you'd like to go into the lounge. Yes. And he says, it's very nice to meet you. And, you uh, too. He, he walks on. It's a little disconcerting, the yellow eyes, because they neither blink nor they're just yellow. Uh, but he goes on. He seems nice. Uh, he says, uh, you might... You might want to go into the lounge while I take care of the next ones. It's, it's up to you. Um, the Ibians are not... Uh, it's difficult to be polite when I speak of the Ibians. I've had them once before. Uh, you may find the smell offensive. Mm. Um, it, it's up to you. Say no more. I will uh, take the hint and uh, go on into uh, the train. The lounge? Okay. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so the rest of you. Retiring to the lounge sounds like an excellent idea. <laughs> uh, Mr. Mir is, will be in the lounge, yes? No, no, no. Yes, he will. And is the other delegation, are they in the lounge or did they go somewhere else? The, they went to the, the lounge um, first, the, sil the silver stones. Yeah, the silvery leaves. You uh, have to go through almost, there to get to Almost elf-like. All right, so let's go, yeah. Yes, to the lounge. <laughs> Does anybody want to stay and see the next delegation? Well, I'll, 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 I'll stick around. Yeah, I'll my curiosity around. is great, and I'm yeah, fairly I, good at holding my distaste. Yeah, I'm mm. sticking around here. Okay, there's a few more minutes as... Uh, as you're you're standing there, and it's it's dark. There's lantern light. Um, the first thing that happens is uh, you smell something on the air. Um, the best best example of what it smells like is a really stinky cheese. Um, you smell that at first, like like old sweat um, uh, and yeast. There's a definitely a yeasty smell in the air. And you can even see uh, uh, Henri sort of, you know, take a step back as, he, as he's standing there. And coming up onto the platform are four very, very odd creatures. Indeed, uh, they are dressed in primitive loincloth uh, sort of thing. And... Uh, they look like this. There are four of them as they walk forward towards Henry. And you can see he sort of pulls him up, so himself up straight uh, so as not to offend. And uh, uh, they walk forward to him. And the one in the lead reaches... In, maybe he had something in his hand or he, he does something but he suddenly holds something out in front of him that from your perspective looks like like a golden frog it's uh, bigger than a frog he holds it out in front of him and the little frog starts screaming um, or at least that's, that's the impression um, it's this high-pitched, painful, loud, sort of screechy noise. And you see um, Henry doesn't really flinch at it, but he, uh, he acknowledges and he bows and he shows them towards the, uh, the gangway. And at this time, he sort of leads the way. 
and they follow sort of flopping behind him as they go. Um, the little frog no longer makes any noise. He leads them, and, and now as they're coming onto the, the gangplank and onto the, the observation platform, the, the reeking smell is almost too much to take. You think you could get used to it, but it would take a while. Um, he takes them across the platform to the big green circle design on the floor, and he hits the button and it slides to the side, and he takes them down into the, the bowels of Mimi, um, and he disappears for a while, and then eventually he comes back out, and he closes the door, and he walks over to you, and he says, well, my friends, what did you think of them? Well, I was uh, not expecting the, uh, that little gold frog of theirs to speak for the party. Oh, yes, they don't actually speak themselves. Uh, the squeaker speaks for them. Uh, it's telepathic. Very not quiet for telepathy. The uh, Ibians have a thousand-year-long dispute with the, with the uh, Sarnathians about a war that took place a thousand years ago. The Sarnathians drove them out of their city into the sea and uh, they want remun remunerations for the offense against their god and their people so we're hosting so they agreed that they'll stay there <laughs> I don't think they would work very well in the lounge I think that it would be very convenient if we had something like Mimi in the waking world to have such deliberations because nobody can get away with any funny stuff on a sentient multi-limbed creature as it uh, reads the minds. The yeah. Ibians have minds? Or only the frog has a mind? No, no, as far as I know, the frog is simply a conduit. Hmm. The Ibians have a long, thousands and thousands of year long civilization. It was very nearly wiped out by the Sarnathians. And were the Sarnathians the first people to board Nimi? Yeah, the silver oh, types. No. Also, right. this, the, the, it's not the first time they've been on board, but um, no, they weren't the first. Of course, they didn't board a thousand years ago. I wasn't here a thousand years ago. No, but they are the silver the, people the who first, came on the first. The first uh, delegation. They're a delegation from Sarnath. Correct. Oh. And the others are a delegation from Ib. Well, I think that's it. Uh, and he sort of looks out, everything's loaded. Uh, and he, he makes a motion and you see the tentacles come back and retract the uh, gangway. And he says, I think that we're ready to go. And as he says that the whole train starts to move. Um, you don't really feel it as it starts to move and do a spot hidden for me. Now, those of you who are in the lounge, you can also do spot hidden if you happen to be glancing out the window. Hard. 92. I am, uh, my eyes have watered too much, I think. Yeah, fail, but not as bad as that. <laughs> hard success. Also hard, yeah. Great. So those of you who pass, so the train starts to move. The crescent of uh, Dilathleen begins to move as you're, as you're going, you're starting to move, as you're starting to go past it. Those of you who passed, you notice something odd all of a sudden up on a, like a hillside or a cliff that's, that's right above the wharf. There's a young woman. Uh, she's, in, she's got dark hair. Uh, she is running. It looks like she's running for her life. Uh, she's dressed in this sort of diaphanous harem costume, if you will. And there are a couple of people chasing behind her. You think it might be guards. Uh, in fact, you get, a, you get a glimpse at the eyeballs that are on there, that are emblazoned on their uniforms. Oh, uh, really? She's running. She's running breakneck from them. Um, 
Henri. Oui, monsieur. Uh, this woman seems to be in distress. Is it too late, do you think, to bring her aboard? Oh, let me... Uh, and he, he sort of leans, and the train, like I say, it's like a caterpillar. It starts to snake a little bit towards one side. The woman sees the train, and uh, she's running. There are stairs coming down, but she doesn't run down the stairs. She runs over to the edge of the cliff, and as she gets to the edge of the cliff, she leaps as if she were doing some ridiculous ballet move in the air and she starts to plummet downward and you see Mimi reach up with a tentacle, wrap it around her, catch her in midair and then bring her over and place her onto the observation platform next to you. And she's like, oh, oh. And she's, she's got kind of a big smile. She says, I, I didn't think I would make it. And Henry walks over to you and he says, Ah, my friend Zusha. Uh, uh, and she says, oh, I'm so glad I got here in time. I thought I would miss it. I would have been in the palace dungeons for sure. And he, he, he turns to you and he says, uh, everyone, this is uh, a former passenger, uh, Zusha. Uh, like some of the others, she also has never gone all the way to the end. And she says, but this time I'm going all the way to the end. It's time we end this nonsense. Well, it seems you are in some danger. Uh, is that why this time is your last trip? Uh, she says, well, no, it's, it, it does have to do with the vizier, vizier Sikander Golgosh. Um, he made an indecent proposal. I danced for him this evening. And um, I refused him, and he doesn't like to be said no to. And when I left, I found that I was being watched intently by the guards. And uh, I realized that my life was in danger, or he was going to imprison me and do what he wanted to with me anyways. So I ran for it, and then I saw the, the train. and thought, Got a way out. <laughs> Oof, I'm very tired. Ugh. But it's nothing that a few stiff drinks won't handle. Mm -hmm. And uh, she does a little twirl, and she very glad, glad to meet you. Uh, charmed, I'm sure. Uh, you are, uh, are you uh, originally uh, a native, or do you come from another land, as we do? Ah, you guys are travelers. Um, I'm also a traveler. Uh, mm. In the real world, I am also in the show business. I am a dancer, but my, my stupid agent uh, has booked me in the worst possible location, per worst venues. Uh, the only redeeming feature is that he's put me on the Orient Express so that I can, uh, that I can travel still. What it's, it's, I think it's going to be my last job. I, it's time I give all that nonsense up. Perhaps you know Herr Bloch, then, if we're yeah. traveling in the same train in the same era. Herr Bloch? Yes, uh, me, I, I uh, am an entertainer also. Oh, oh, I... And she, she talks to you about the entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, you're a magician, she's a dancer. Mm -hmm. um, you've never heard of each other. <laughs> um, so you go in to join the others and uh, you sit down. Uh, Dr. Edison and uh, uh, whoever else is in the, the lounge. Um, the Sarnathians continue to do this. Oh, I, 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 I failed to mention one thing. The Sarnathians have servants. Okay. The servants sort of follow along the line behind. They're dressed in rather drab, uh, un, unshowy clothing. Um, the Sarnathians had a good many uh, boxes and things like that, probably with clothes, uh, because, you know, 
they have a style they like to wear. And they're not like you on the ship. They're paying or paid customers. They're not doing anything like going to the end. Um, as you guys are in there, and they've sort of become very clickish. They're over in the corner giggling and laughing, carrying on. Um, one of the servants, a young woman, uh, she comes over to where you are. And uh, specifically, she talks to Dr. Dr. York. Um, excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, my lady uh, was wondering if you would like to join us at our table. Would be my honor. Hmm. All right. It was there somebody with you? Uh, Dr. Gun uh, Gunter, you were with him, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. She completely ignores you. Hmm. Seem to have had that effect on women on this train. Um, and if you start to rise as well, she's just like, not you. Oh. Um, all right. So once again, as you are approaching the little clique of these six people, um, there seems to be some sort of inside joke as you approach, they're giggling and laughing and, you know, yes, from one another, stuff like that. Uh, you, you step forward, you step up to the table and one of the gentlemen who's got a drink in hand and he's rather swarthy, he looks up at you and he says, uh, um, he says, uh, uh, Dulcine here thinks that you're rather attractive. Well. And she kicks. He says, personally, I, I don't care much for purebred humans, but uh, uh, of, of the people I saw you with outside, you're probably the best looking of the bunch. Well, madam... It is my honor to make your acquaintance. And she sort of extends her hand. And he says, the, the guy says, that's, uh, uh, her name is uh, Dulcine. Uh, my name is uh, Teofed. And, uh, and then he, he points to the others. This gentleman is Amar, and this is Kavomel. And this is Ibli uh, and uh, Besuit. The other two ladies. Um, so, and then he begins to ask you questions. Where are you from? Oh, you're a doctor. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, how can you stand to work on people who are inferior to you? Well, I, I guess it never occurred to me in that quite such manner i i have a calling to to heal a to calling. a calling call, yes who called you a calling within my heart to to try and 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 bring uh, uh health to those who are injured and sick to to do what i can to heal and 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 make my uh fellow mankind uh well again well, it's the most selfless thing I've ever heard of. I hope you have plenty of time for fun and food and sex and everything else. Well, I make what time I can, for sure. Are you married, Dr. York? One of the girls asked, giggling. <laughs> uh, I will turn and look at her with a wry smile and say, why, I am not. Because, are you be, um, are you betrothed? Oh, we don't do that sort of thing. I just heard somewhere that humans commit to a single partner for life, or sometimes not. But you know, we don't do that. We have sex for fun. Oh, I, I see. Well, that is uh, uh, quite freeing, I would imagine. Well, perhaps we'll invite you to a few parties, but uh, uh, that's all for now. You can go back. 
<laughs> uh, I see. Well, enjoy your trip. Oh, we will. Go. Mm. And uh, Dr. York, as you uh, are walking back to where your friends are now, where they've, they've taken a seat, um, uh, at first you think there's a rock in the carpet because you stumble a little bit. Uh. And when you stumble, um, you, you put your hand out uh, like uh, to a table to stop yourself from falling. Um, but you're lying on your back and you're just reaching into the air in front of you this and the sunlight of the early of the morning is coming in through the window of the orient express you are lying in bed in fact you all felt a little jolt as you you come to your eyes open um and it's one of those rare moments in your life where you feel perfectly comfortable lying there in your cot the light coming through the window is magical the sound of the train wheels is hypnotic and you just had the best night's sleep that you can remember in your whole life um and you can all uh you can all roll for sanity and if you succeed, you can add one d four points of sanity. <laughs> Pass yeah. with a thirty nine. I succeeded. And got a whopping one point. I so got two. I rolled a ninety five. I rolled a ninety three. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't get any more sanity back, but you feel wonderful. And. Ah. And there was that, what was it that you were dreaming? You can all roll, I, we went over this before, you can all roll uh, willpower. And if you fail, you can't remember anything. If you succeed, you can remember a little bit. If you hard, you remember more. And extreme, you remember everything. It's standard, yep, standard success. Regular. So. 59 is a regular. Oh. Regular. Cool. I am much saner and I have no idea what you're talking about. And that will last until you start talking about it. <laughs> In which case things will start to click. Hmm. Edison right, gets so. up. Edison gets up and gets to his journal and starts putting down everything that he can remember into his journal. Okay. I check. Oh. And of course, I, just like any dream, that starts to sort of fade into the background for now. Quick, um, okay. You guys are sharing rooms too, so yeah. Gunther and I are, yes. Yeah, I look over at him writing in his journal, and it was him being so fervent. I don't want to interrupt, but I'm like, hmm. What was that? What was that? Sarnathians? And what was the other? What was the other? Sorry, Sir Nath. That's that rings a bell. I can't quite place where I've heard that word before. Yeah, I had the strangest dream. You were there, and and Gabriel was there, and Dorian was there, and Roland was there, and Teddy was there. It's uh, very strange. Mm -hmm. I had the same. What? Well, I mean, I had a dream where we were all there, all together. We we're exploring some city. Yes. 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 Bilath something, right? Um, seems like that. That's right. It reminded me of uh, being on a Greek island. You know, lots of uh, going up hills and. Right. 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 This and this crazy woman dove off a cliff, jumped out of a cliff at the train. Mm hmm. So Insane. you look over at your clocks and you know that breakfast is going to be served in just you know, 15, 20 minutes. Uh -huh. mm. I'll check to make sure the washroom is uh, uh, available and uh, start getting ready for the day. All right. So we'll assume you all get dressed and you make your way in. 
You all look so refreshed and comfortable. Ah. Must be this Orient Express. It's a it, true it, five star hotel. It like <laughs> ro- rocks you to sleep like uh like my mother used to. So I, I had the most magnificent sleep of my life. I've never felt so so well rested before. I know, it was oddly satisfying. I suspected I would like being on an upper bunk, I think, for the greater sway. But yes, very peaceful. Ah. Yes, best night's sleep I've had in a very, very long time. Hmm. Darnest dream, though. Oh, I had I had an odd dream, too. I also had an odd dream. In fact, you guys were in it. At least I think you were all in it. Yeah, I... I... I vaguely, yeah. Well, I have a vague memory of walking into a creature. Right. It had little stairs and a little room inside. And tentacles. Yes, and the walls down the steps felt soft. Yes. Soft and spongy. I, I dreamed we were all on some kind of some kind of train, but it but it wasn't a train. It was like a like a, a, a string of elephants, or maybe one giant elephant thing. And there was I do, I I don't recall it fully, but in the engine room there was like weird creatures. Correct. I, I don't know anything about about no? that, but I do know there was a cat that was quite fond of rolling. Oh, I remember. I, I dreamt of a little gray kitten. It's very, very pretty. Blue eyes. Yeah. Oh, I don't. I, don't. Don't remember. That was that. my dream. Mm-hmm. Don't remember. It does, it does slowly start come back, coming back to you as the others oh. reinforce your. Yeah. Okay. Nimbus. Oh, yeah. Nimbus. Got a cloud name. No, Nimbus. Prince Nimbus. Prince. Because they were. Oh, there was the man with the cat in the beard. Remember the cat in the beard? Yeah, there were cats. That's right. Yeah. Hmm. Yes, there were, there were a lot of cats. There was a lot of cats. Yes, I remember. This is ridiculous. This is where we're all describing each other's dreams. This is hmm. very peculiar. Yes, there's cats everywhere. And there was, there was a man, a, a, a steward of the train. Oh, Ray. Oh, yeah. He yeah. had a funny. Ma- he had a funny his, mask, right? His yeah. face was Cover very, burns. Yeah, he was. Burns. He was hurt really bad. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. he was hurt. Hurt bad in the the eighteen nineties. He said, "Right." Yes. A fire. I'm pretty sure. It, this and can't be. There was a wo- there was a woman who did not like men. Yes. <laughs> oh yes. Oh yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, <laughs> that's how I know it was a dream, and she didn't like me. <laughs> well, she was not the only dream lady who didn't seem to like you. Yeah. How are we doing this, though? We're, we're all... that this. You're saying exactly what I dreamed. Well, the, the, Theodore, after, after that place, after going to that underground place of the Viscount, and the arm and those roses, I, I'm. Yes. I find such a dream. Dorian, I assume you. Have... Excuse me, Dorian. I assume you checked on your parcel this morning. Uh, I I would most likely have checked on it. Yeah. Yes. Well, you saw the bag is still there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Actually, so just just little, cuddled little, up with it. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> nice and cuddled. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, it's it's all the dreaming was odd, but oh, we all feel nice and refreshed, and I don't know. I mean, Speaking of the 1890s, Doctor Edison <laughs> feels in his pocket that he's got Smythe's journal, right? <laughs> and you've still got quite a few hours to go before you get to Lausanne. It's a long, it was a 14 hour long trip. So well we should we should check this out. 
Yeah. Let me refresh my cup of coffee before we uh, crack it open. So. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you, uh, you refresh your coffee. You guys all get yourselves comfortable. Maybe you move to a... a After breakfast to maybe a lounge area where we can sit yes. in more privacy. And You also have a sudden feeling that although this place is quite comfortable, quite luxurious, it's not the dream terrain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a lot more cramped than what you kind yeah. of wish that it was. But and the uh, motion is a great deal more herky jerky, that's certain. Mm-hmm. Uh, you get comfortable, and um, mm. uh, who would like to start reading the journal first? I can. Oh, oh. Gabriel? <laughs> okay. Professor Smythe's journal 18, uh, Professor Smythe's 1893 journal recounts his first year as a professor at the City and Guilds College of the University of London. It includes descriptions of lectures, anecdotes of the Oriental Club, and notes from his studies in anthropological history, literature, and metaphysics. The bulk of the journal concerns a strange affair involving his friend and colleague Professor Garo Demir from Constantinople, and a journey taken by some of his close London associates aboard the Orient Express. Smith's handwriting becomes difficult to read in the latter parts of the journal, and it becomes apparent how terribly these events affected him. Telegrams and letters from Professor Demir are tucked into the binding. It is with great trepidation that I set into writing the events that transpired in 1893. Many will think me wildly imaginative when I describe the horrors that were revealed, but I swear they are true. It began in mid-August on a terrible dark night when I was convinced convinced beyond any doubt that evil was about to succeed in an unmitigated victory over the forces of good. Thus, I felt it necessary to summon my best colleagues to join me in that infamous white chapel slum, that we might solve this nightmare together. It is fortunate that street urchins can easily be found wandering past midnight in that godforsaken district, and a penny is more than enough to send a message. tell you gentlemen i love my dear winifred but sometimes she can get on my nerves you know what i mean she says you're going out for another night with those friends of yours and i said yes winifred this is what we do seems no matter how many times i try to reiterate that point it never seems to go anywhere they just don't ever seem to understand Montgomery. Uh, always trying to chat back and uh, i have enough that's why i i like chatting with you all it gets me away from that. <sighs> <laughs> you English, you little women w- walk all over you. <laughs> Those of us who are fool enough to marry in the first place, I suppose. Huh. As you guys are enjoying your uh, evening at the Blue Rose Cafe, um, a young and rather dirty a uh, street boy comes running up to Charles, says, excuse me, sir, are you uh, Mr. Mockford? I am, Job. And he hands you a uh, business card and puts his hand up for a penny. Yeah, I, I, I put a pence in his hand. Oh, it's a, uh, it's a message from uh, Dr. Smythe. It says, I am at 5 Durward Street in Whitechapel. Oh, my. For God's sake, come. Bring a gun. Julius Smythe. Well, the Whitechapel. Lord, that sounds serious. Yes, the infamous Whitechapel. Yeah, was uh, Jack the Ripper active in 1893? Just just a couple of years ago. Okay, yeah. yeah, I was just making sure I had the right timeline. (laughs) Well, I, I don't have a gun with me, but we could stop by uh, my home and I could get my uh, my birding gun. Yes, I think if if Smythe is wanting us to get a gun, I think we should, oh, if if you do, I know, get a gun. I think it might be wise to trust a man, especially Whitechapel. We, we all know what occurred not that long ago. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so well, I'm sure any ruffians... I'm sorry, do you all arm up then? 
Uh, unless someone gives Dimitri a gun, he doesn't own one. So it'll just be, uh, uh, he's got a nice big fat signet ring on his hand that he can use to clobber someone with. I'll bring a wrench. It's a question of how far the blue rose is from my flat, I suppose. I'd be happy to pick up a revolver, but I probably didn't bring one out for a quiet coffee, the gentleman. So you can all arm yourselves within 10 minutes. It'll take another 10 minutes to get over to White Chapel. Uh, should we take a uh, hansom together or? Oh, yeah. I, yes. I, I, I would think so. Right. Uh, wise. So in 10 minutes, we'll meet at the corner of F- Fair Lane and Keys and then take a hansom down together to this. Was it Durham? I yes. believe that's right. Yes. Five Durham. Mm-hmm. All right, so you all pull yourselves together. It's it's um, it's August, so it's probably warm. It's foggy. There's definitely some fog coming off the town. So, um, you drive into Whitechapel. Whitechapel uh, is not a great area to be. Obviously, the gruesome murders happened before. There's prostitution. Um, and as you are driving, you're, you're, you figure that the house you're going to is just down the street. I'd like you all to do spot hiddens. Oh, yeah. Regular. No, I do not. Oh, see a seven. Thing. An extreme oh. success. <laughs> as you are moving through the fog, and of course, the street lights are probably a set of street lights. They're bright, but they're, they're, they're not that bright this time of the evening, and the fog is making them, putting halos around them. Um, there's not many people out on the street this time of night, but there are a few, probably street walkers and people like that. You notice, just as you're turning onto the street you're going onto, um, Someone standing on the corner that as you move by, they hide themselves. You see them step into the shadow of an alley. And the one thing that sort of stands out on the person, whoever they are, is they were wearing a fez. Hmm. That's an odd, quite an odd chap. It's not an odd hat this time of the, the world. I mean, Fez is popular, but somebody in a Fez out on the street at 10.30 or 11 o'clock at night is a little weird. And he definitely had the feeling that he was hiding himself as he went by. This doesn't look too good. I, I hope this isn't some sort of setup. Well, oh. as, you, as you pull up, you can see that one house on the street, uh, there's more light on the porch. And uh, through the fog, you can see uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Smythe, and he's sort of pacing back and forth on the, uh, the porch as you come pulling up. Uh, he seems uh, very relieved, and he turns to a woman who now you notice is standing next to him. And she looks older and uh, um, dressed in like a house coat. Uh, he says something to her, and she goes back inside. Uh, I should mention at this this point in time, uh, Professor Smythe is about thirty four, so he's he's got a hefty beard, but it's not white; it's black or it's brown, and uh, he still has all of his old habits that that your other characters are completely familiar with. Mm-hmm. Um, he's just a lot younger; he's thirty years younger. Uh, he comes down to meet the cab. He helps opening opening the door of the the the, the, the you know the carriage, and uh, it helps you all out. Oh, thank God! Oh, thank God! You've arrived. He's like, uh, this this is definitely one for our club. Hey, dear fellow. No, I'm not going to say anything until we get inside, just because. I don't like to repeat myself, but um, I'm going to warn you now. It's um, it's rather gruesome. It smells pretty bad in there. Come, come, mm. come, come. 
business. And uh, as he gets back to the door, that woman is, has come back to the door and he says to you, this is Mrs. Uh, Grimm. Uh, she's the owner of the, the property. Uh, she rents out rooms. Um, follow me upstairs. Now, there is a smell to the house. And I mean, you know the normal smell of, well, you know, the lower class dwellings. They're, they're kind of dirty. There's a smell of uh, odd things that have been cooked in there that have been spilled. There's a smell of fish. Um, but there's also something much worse as you're going up the stairs that smells very much like decay and, uh, and fecal matter and stuff like that, oh. like, like old vomit. Um, you go inside of a room. Uh, the room is lit with a, a couple of candles and um, lying on the bed is what looks like a very old man. He's clean shaven but he's very wrinkly. And on top of his head is a fez. And uh, you can see that there were leather straps uh, attached on the sides of the bed in order to restrain him. Uh, They've been removed and thrown back. Uh, The man is writhing uh, and uh, mumbling uh, it sounds almost like nonsense, uh, but the smell is definitely coming from him uh, lying there on the bed. And also, you don't see it at first, but because the room is kind of shadowy. Um, on the other side of the room, somebody moves, uh, and they they move forward and stand up. And uh, uh, Professor Smythe says, "This is." Uh, this is Dr. Niles Hobbs. He's with the police. Uh, and he brings you all inside. He closes the door. And he says, now, um, where do I begin? Uh, I believe, and he, he points at the man on the bed. He says, this is not an old man. This is a student by the name of Matthew Pook. And someone has done this to him. Uh, what, what would cause you to draw this conclusion? Well, um, the doctor doesn't believe me, but I, I know him. I recognize him. Uh, he was sent here. Oh, it's a long story. I'm afraid that, that I'll have to save that for, for later. We need to get him out of here. Uh, Mrs. Grimm informs me that four days ago, there were a number of gentlemen that came here, um, a man calling himself Mr. Leeds, dressed in a top hat and a coat tails, and he and three other gentlemen brought this boy with them. Um, he claimed that it was his brother, that his brother was strung out on drugs, and that he was trying to help him. And so she allowed him to rent the room. But the first day, uh, she said that some of the other guests in the, the, the house um, thought that they were hearing noises uh, that sounded like whispers. Uh, They heard creaking and odd banging occasionally on the walls. The second day he was shrieking and the men were claimed still that they were trying to help him, that he was just coming down from drugs. And then this evening um, she called the police and the police came, uh, along with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Hobbs here, and the police said, uh, uh, by then these gentlemen had fled. Um, she said that the one in the top hat seemed to be in charge, and the other three were all wearing fezes. Hmm. Uh, she says they fled when the police came, Uh but that the police couldn't do anything. All the police saw was a sick old man in bed. 
and that there was no crime. And so they left, the doctor stayed, but uh, uh, they, they told me that, mas- that uh, Mr. Pook uh, called out my name. And so they contacted me and that's why I'm here this evening. And I'm afraid those men are going to come back. They've been doing something evil here, something nightmarish. Yeah, I, I, I spotted a uh, I spotted a chap in the shadows wearing a fez uh, on our way over here. Yes, now that the police have left, oh. I'm afraid we're in some dear, danger. Dear God, this this man or boy needs to be in the hospital. And uh, if you look closely, um, and he points to it, he says, "The fez is." Not exactly a fez, and it seems to be, and he points, he says, we, we can't remove it. It seems to have fused itself onto his flesh. Um, as you look closely at the fez, uh, it is, in fact, very strange. You can almost see writing uh, in the fabric itself, and you're not precisely sure that it's mm. fabric I, the the lettering it almost looks like hieroglyphics it seems to move and um, I'd like you to all do listen rolls as you lean towards it yes hard success for change. catastrophic failure yeah, I'm, no we're close well, it's probably good. Um, yeah. James Ludlow, yeah. as he leans in, he turns his head as he gets close, and you can hear it whispering. Uh, but it's not whispering outside, it's whispering inside. It's whispering into his brain or something. And he, he uh, 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 um, mutters incomprehensibly. Are you okay? Sir? Oh, he won't answer you. He's, I don't think he's entirely there, but uh, I no, think no. the key to this is getting the, uh, is getting the hat off. Uh, the doctor says he can do it in a surgery at the, uh, at the hospital, but uh, and he looks over at the doctor and the doctor says, I, I won't touch it again. Oh. None, of you, this... none of you heard that? What, what, what do you mean you won't touch it again? You're a doctor, no. for God's sake. No, you, there's something wrong with that thing. Uh, Miss... Sir, are you, are you, did no one else hear? Hear, uh, hear what, James? But he's uh, he's I tap, Dimitri I again, oh pushes I... James aside, <laughs> takes the blanket and starts wrapping the blanket around the old man and then heft him up and say come we go okay um you um you you uh, i would like you to do a uh, dexterity thing oh success okay um what happens is, is you you try to you wrap the blanket around him and you start to heft him up, and uh, he's he's kind of hanging limp. It's like he's not helping you at all. And um, as you sort of turn him around, uh, uh, Charles Mockford is standing next to you, mm-hmm. and as you turn, the hat brushes against your arm and when it does this wave of nausea rolls over you like you're you don't even know where it comes from but in that moment you see flashes inside of your mind of things that you don't even understand what you're seeing. It's, it's like a vast universe of insanity that you're seeing for just a moment. And you can do a constitution roll to see if you, oh, God. If you vomit. 
I got a 40 constitution, so I do not vomit. Hey. Okay. So you, but you're, you're definitely wretched, yeah. but you're just oh. holding it in. Charles, Charles, you okay? Oh, just... Dimitri, so... why I'm reckless? Where, Be where careful with him. Come, so quickly, take, take pillow slip and, and put it over old man's head. Let us go quickly. I, I'll I head over to and help Dimitri. Yeah, we need to get this this man or boy to a to a hospital someplace other than here. Dimitri, as you're holding him, uh, something happens. You feel him begin to shake, not violently, but you hear that sort of distinct sound of a death rattle where he's sort of gasping for breath and a couple seconds go by and he goes completely limp Mm. in your arms. If you could hear breathing, he's no longer breathing. Um, He feels like he's just died in your arms. Oh. And I'll... I'll put him back down on the bed. Oh. Okay, and as you're putting him back down, the doctor leans in to check and see if he is, in fact, dead. And the hat falls off of his head and rolls onto the floor. And when it does, the candles in the room flicker and suddenly go out. And it's oh. pitch dark. And then you hear the doctor screaming. <laughs> And struggle. Okay. Okay. Get get a light on. Get. Come on. Yeah. Anyone? Yeah. You uh, guys oh, probably have lighters. Yeah, lighters. Yeah, yeah. like a little match. Or... <laughs> All right. Uh, you light up the you light up the room, and there's that sort of flash as the, the match or the lighter ignites. And at first, you don't know what it is you're looking at, but A second later, you realize that the man that was put down on the bed, he is transformed. Uh, It's almost as if his skull has stretched upward and his mouth has been, all of his skin has been pulled back and his tongue comes out with multiple barbs and he has ripped the face off of the doctor. Oh. And it's a sanity roll? Yeah, you can do a sanity yeah. roll. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> no. What the fuck? Jeez. Oh, one. Oh, holy shit. Well, <laughs> oh, yeah. Cool as a cucumber. Yeah, my dice <laughs> let me down there. I, I am going to spend. No, uh, no, I can't. No, I'm. No, I. Oop, I'm, that's a fail in sanity. He's failed. He's failed. All right. The thing is growling and writhing and ripping into the doctor. And the doctor is screaming because he's still alive. Um, what do you guys want to do? Yeah. Uh, what was what, any sand loss for pass fail? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, 1d4 if you failed. Uh, 1d4 plus one. And then uh, just Three. one if you, if you, if you survive. Yeah, I want awesome to. Oh. One D four plus one. That gives uh, me a five. Yeah. <laughs> uh, why don't you go ahead and roll? Uh, In my oh, do be yeah, eight. Is this I the need, first bout of madness of the campaign? I think so. I need to. Uh, well, he, get, he gets his intel roll. He could fit, still fill that. <laughs> uh, no, I don't. I I I passed. <laughs> uh, so the, uh, three. Oh. Um. You you start screaming uh, and backing <laughs> up against the wall. Uh, as, as I scream, I I might have just let off a gunshot in the air because I did that. I was ready, and then I panicked. So yeah, gunshot. Dimitri. Oh. Dimitri yells, "Saint Peter's ghost!" He'll yeah. he'll reel back and just haul off and kick uh, uh, that which was once known as Mister Pook. Well, it's up on the bed. Gonna... Oh, I'll sure. 
All right. Um, uh, Perhaps you should go to combat runs because I might fire yeah. before you can kick. Yeah. All right. Who's got the uh, highest decks? Well, I my decks is very poor. I'm at so, 70. Yeah, I have a 45, and I also have a gun, so that gives yeah. you the, the ready weapon. You get the plus 50, thing. plus 50 for being ready. Hopefully everyone's ears are all right, because my gun went off as I screamed. Yeah. Right. So, I was, it, oh, looks like David's I'll put it in the chat. Dimitri has an 85. I, I, oh. I, yeah, and I um, don't believe that I was... Uh, I didn't have pistol at the ready. I had it in pocket, but I was using a light, so... I don't think I get right. that extra. So, if, so I guess Dimitri, I... Uh, go ahead and do a brawl. Even before anybody with a ready firearm, because they'll a... get plus 50 to their decks. I have my, my birding, my uh, shotgun oh. with me. So 45 plus okay. 50 puts me in a 95. So I think I slightly okay. edge Dimitri out. Then you my go fit. first. You had your gun ready. I will oh. fire the birding pellets into this thing. Okay. Oh, that's going to be loud. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, a 12. That is an extreme success on the bot. Nice. Um, go ahead and do damage. So what it would be... I, I don't have the damage handy on me. Uh, what gauge? Oh, it would be for, it's for bird hunting, so fairly... Well, like 20 at most, I'd say. 20 gauge is 2d6 at that range. Yeah. I think. Okay. It's not meant to do a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just it's just pellets. Um, anyway. uh, four. Okay. Or, yeah, um, and it's not impaling, or is it? You, you hit the thing, and it doesn't seem to bleed, uh, but you can see that you've done some damage to it. Uh, and it throws... Uh, the doctor on the floor and sort of rises up on the bed to attack you. And then Dimitri, yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Unless there were any other ready firearms? I was not ready. <laughs> it's a swing and a miss. Oh. You is, kick, he, is he you fighting kick. back? Uh, it's not ready to fight back yet, but okay. it will. Uh, and this thing hanging out of its mouth now is like uh, it, 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 it almost it, its head has deformed itself almost so that it looks like a fez. And in the process, it's it's pulled back all of its skin and its tongue now sort of resembles a tassel, but it's uh, got barbs on the end of it. Yeah, honestly. Swinging around. Um, who's next? I am. Um, I take a shot at this blasphemy. Uh, 32 is a good shot. Uh, and that handgun I have, I have no information about it at all because we didn't do that process. What is it? I have no, I have no specifications. It's just a handgun. Uh, you know yeah, what kind of gun? A, a pocket gun from 1893. We would never do that part. It's a big Hmm. Like handguns. Yeah, I'd have to look in a different book that has uh, 1,800 weapons. Probably like a D2. Oh, yeah, like my little Derringer probably. I have does 1D6. Yeah, so. I was going to say, probably more like a D6. Sure. Four? Oh, good hit. Four, mm -hmm. Four more damage. All right. Next. I have a lot of cursing. Is, uh... Uh, I am faster than uh, Sydney with my right. Dexa 60. And as I said, I have a little Derringer with uh, one bullet. Okay. That goes into the wall. Okay. <laughs> Sydney, you make it first because we, we are both on 50. So. All right. Here we go. And uh oh, I, <laughs> I miss. So you swing and you miss. I very very miss eighty. And then James, you've you've sort of recovered. Yeah. And now my gun's At least not. You can point your gun. Yeah, and I will fire. 
but... an extreme. Guys, uh, I don't have it written down either. Like the gun, a kind of gun, Do you service know? revolver, I guess, of some kind. Thirty-eight. Right? Would that be like a thirty-eight? Probably be like a, at least a D8. Yeah, if it was a nineteen twenties, it'd be a D10. So it's maybe a D8 in the eighteen hundreds. Four. I'm not sure there'd be that much difference. I, I don't uh, think there'd be any difference. Yeah. Don't forget, if it's an extreme, that's an impale, so you get the max damage plus your dice. Oh, yeah. We're right. also in a fairly yeah. small room. Yeah, map. It's a max damage first. Uh, what I rolled, so it will say it's, if we say it's a D8, then that's twelve. Twelve. Twelve more points. All right. Um, you managed to shoot it right in the skull, and when you do, it splatters as it's try as it was trying to reach for you. Um, it, it splatters. The whole thing falls to the floor. And uh, for a moment, you guys are all plunged back into darkness since the matches or candles or, or I mean, uh, uh, lighters that you had. Um, what the? Uh, is it mm -hmm. dead? Hear, Smile. Find Dr. the doctor. Hobbs. You can hear Dr. Hobbs moaning on the floor uh, and, and almost sort of man crying. I mean, he's oh. obviously had his face ripped off. Doc, are you okay? Doc, I'm, go I'm going. I'm trying to get to the doc. Yeah, he ain't okay. <laughs> I know. <Yeah. laughs> no. Trying to, trying to get more of a response out of him. I know he's not okay, but... But once again, it's still in the dark. Oh, you, you relit your candle? I mean, there are candles in the room. They just went out. Yeah. yeah. Right. what can you do for the man? I'm going over to the man. And not that kind of a doctor. Um, we need to get every... Uh, into the hospital. He says, you know... I uh, and while you're standing there, you're, you're not sure that he's not just going to expire in the next couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. um, oh, dear God. And he looks over at that fez lying on the floor. Um, you no longer hear anything from it. And the smell begins to sort of dissipate. Um, Is there something we can wrap that thing in? Here, let me. I'll, I'll kind of scoop it up at the very end of my of my shotgun. Okay. Is kind there a of, pillowcase uh, we can deposit it in? Uh, yeah, there should be. Here, take, um, take this. While they're doing that, I'm going to see if I can do any first aid on the doctor. You know, just okay. He's he's gurgling on his own blood at this point. Yeah, I'm going to do the ABC of course, airway. People uh, in the building have also come up mm -hmm. the stairs to see what's going on. And uh, Smythe sees that there's so many people, and he says, I'll tell you what, it'll be easier for me to explain what's going on. Why don't you all leave and meet me at the Oriental Club tomorrow, uh, say around 10 o'clock? I'll uh, take the hat. And the, uh, I'm sure they've called the police. So I'll have to explain to the police what's going on. For God's sake, be careful of the thing. It's well, not entirely a nerd, I think. Be very careful. Uh, this isn't James speaking. Dorian, out of the just yet. Gable, did you just describe that horrifying? That is awful. Awful yes, I, I thought the I thought the thing with the arm and the roses was was horrible, but this is. Uh, but if this that is something would, else. if that, if this is real and re oh my God, poor Smythe going for all of this, no wonder he is how he is. <laughs> but wow, I mean the the fezes again with the fezes, uh, the people who attack Smythe and carve that those words into his chest weren't they wearing fezes? Yes, at least we have a connection there. We'll have to see where this goes. Do um, I'll ask you the question. Uh, Smythe, of course, is just as unnerved as all of you. Uh, he was unarmed. That's kind of why he told us to bring guns. Uh, he had no idea what was going to go on. 
Um, you do one of two things. You can all uh, be the hasty retreat and he'll meet you tomorrow. Or uh, you can uh, wait around, explain to the police, and then go back. Uh, he suggests that you all just sleep at his place, at St. John's, uh, John's place, which is not too far. Which all of the people reading remember, that's where he was, and that's the place that got burned down eventually. Mm. I plan What's to... Your- uh be the hasty retreat with him ask ask us to leave and uh meet him uh meet him tomorrow all right as well as bernard knowles is going to uh go across the street and down the block a few a few paces and watch the police arrive and see what the response is not entirely uh without a certain hope that the entire building will go up in flames after Smythe gets out, because it seems so profoundly unclean. But I want to make sure that at least Smythe comes out in one piece. And I'd like to see also whether there are any other befezed Whitechapel denizens lurking about. I'll be with you right there by your side, Bernard. Yeah, uh, good, so- I, will, I will also be with you, Bernard. All right. And- Duh. So you, instead of beating a hasty retreat, I guess you go and hide in the fog and watch to see what happens. Um, uh, Indeed, the police arrive. Um, Since the police are actually the people that brought in Professor Smythe, and they know his reputation, uh, he's not detained. Uh, And you don't know exactly what excuse that he gave or what happened and uh, the horrors that are there. But eventually the police, uh, the police leave. Um, the bodies are probably taken as well. And uh, Smythe also begins to leave, not knowing that you guys are hiding out in the fog. Um, he has in his hands a hat box. You think probably the lady gave him a hat box. It's extremely incongruous to the what's going on around you because it's a white and pink striped candy striped Mm. hat box um, like peppermint stripes Uh, and he's carrying it very carefully as he comes down the brownstone steps uh, uh, waits for a uh, a carriage to pick him up which he's probably called for And he is looking around like, holy shit. Yeah. And we, we haven't seen any sinister characters approach the place in no, any you way. No. You haven't seen anything. Well, Too, Too, Too many him. Too many cops around. Too many cops around. Oh, 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 you frightened me. Oh, you didn't go home after all. Yes, yeah, sorry. We were, we were concerned sorry. about you. Um... My, uh, my nerves. I've got the thing in this box. Yes, yeah, so let's let's see it back uh, to safety. Well, it is uh, quite a terrible thing. That's I it. need to make. I need to make a number of inquiries. I, mm-hmm. I uh, let's let's go back, and I'll show you some of the stuff. This is not entirely unknown to me. My, uh, mm-hmm. uh, you get a cab. So as you're in the cab going, he's explaining some of this to you. I have a friend in. Constantinople, Professor Demir. Uh, he's a well-known scholar. He's impeccable. Very, very good man. Very good man. Um, he wrote me a, a telegram a number of days ago telling me that there was this um, cult leader that he suspected was here and that he had obtained this hat, this uh, blood red fez. And that it was, in fact, a a legendary, um, horrible artifact that's spoken of in many, um, many pieces of literature. Uh, He brought it here and uh, he said that one of his uh, students, Matthew Pook, uh, was in the area and that he had intended to watch uh, Mr. uh, He called himself here Mr. Leeds. But I believe that his correct name is uh, 
uh, Eronimus Lati, mm-hmm. that he is in fact the leader of this cult, uh, and he's an Englishman, uh, despite whatever his name might sound like, uh, that he had intended, that Mr. Pook had intended to follow him and keep track of him. And then he got a postcard saying that um, Mr. Pook saw the opportunity to steal the feds. And uh, he was advised not to, but uh, that was the last we heard of him. Now we know that he failed and got captured and they did this to him. Um, As soon as we get back, I'll show you the postcards. So you drive to his St. John's house uh, he takes you inside and places that on a desk uh, and says, uh, here, let me show you. Uh, here's the first postcard from August Tuesday, 1st. August 1st, 1893. Professor J. Smythe. Have been keeping tabs on cult activity. Stop a man named Lotti has come to possession of a terrible item known as the Blood Red Fez. Stop. He is traveling to England on some mysterious purpose. Stop. One of my students based in London has volunteered to follow him and report. Stop. Demir and... Mm. Oh, this is the second one. Friday, 4th, 1883. J. Smythe. My student, Pook, has elected to try and steal the fez. Stop. I have warned him Lottie is dangerous, but he will not listen. Stop. I fear for his safety. Stop. He has your address in London. Stop. Please aid him if you can. Stop, Demir, and... And the last, that's the last any of us heard of him until this evening when apparently he called my name. They hmm. came and got me. So it was the poor blasted police doctor that recognized your name? Is that what? No. Well, uh, Matthew Pook called my name out. And uh, I think the police also know my name fairly well. Well, It must have been the police doctor that, you know, or I I see. Yes, I'm sure Mrs. uh, Grimm did not recognize your name. So she called the police. The police heard the name. Then they they called you. Yes. Mm. In any case. Mm. Uh-huh. Um, have to figure out what to do. I need to contact uh, Mr. Demir, uh, Professor Demir, immediately. And, and you had no was... contact with this Pook previously? Uh, I think I met him once. Um, he was aware of you, but you were not associated at all. Correct. I see. Poor bastard. Um, so, as difficult as it may be to sleep, uh, we can get started in the morning. I think I'm going to uh, send a message immediately, a telegraph uh, to uh, to Demir, and see what he says by the morning. Hopefully, he'll, he'll answer. He doesn't. You don't. You don't have a previous familiarity with this uh, red fez. Not really. I mean, there are some. There are a lot of legends one reads about. I'm sure you might be able to find some stuff in the library mm. concerning it, especially Middle Eastern and uh, you know, Persian uh, stuff, maybe even Greek. Mm. It's an old legend, of course. We can see now that it's more than just a legend. Yeah, poor Pook somehow mutated into that horrible thing there. I'm going to have to contact his family. Right? I know his address. Do you think there's any chance that the doctor survived? I don't know. They rushed him to the hospital. I doubt that he'll ever be himself again. I mean, Mm. he's going to be deformed beyond all recognition. Did did they collect? Most horrible. Most horrible. Did they collect Matthew's body? Uh, Yes, as far as I know, Uh, there wasn't much left. It uh, it seems to have sort of deteriorated. Of course, it was already heavily deteriorated. The man's in his tw- early 20s. Mm. Yes. It seemed to suck the life out of him. 
And, uh, yeah. The doctor tried to remove it at first, and when he did, he touched it and said that he felt overwhelming nausea and saw flashes in his mind of something horrible. There are things in this world that are never meant to be fiddled with. All right. Mm. Right. Quite, quite the dreadful business. I do not feel safe having that thing in the house, but uh, I don't see any other. Well, I certainly option. think you should put it in something sounder than a hat box. Do you have any lead? Or something. We'll have to see yeah. if we can find something tomorrow. I'd like to just toss it into the fireplace. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I don't. Maybe think wise. That. Or a bonfire outdoors. Or clamp it into an iron box and bury it. Well, let's yeah. let's have at it. He walks over to the fireplace, grabs the tongs, mm -hmm. and comes over and flips the top off the box and grabs the thing. I it's back the, away when he gets it out. He, he, he walks over to the fireplace and he tosses it into the fireplace. And it sits there for a few moments, the flames licking around it but nothing happens it doesn't burn it doesn't sizzle it doesn't that's even seem possible good mm. god this thing what the hell is it well uh, it's natural that's said. certain i'll have to see what demir says i'll have to write immediately a telegram and have it sent hopefully the time difference between us will allow him to get back to me quickly and he sits down and writes a telegram um, mm -hmm. and then goes over and retrieves it from the fire and drops it back in the hat box and closes the lid. Just, just it's not even smoking. Oh, yeah. not even generating heat. Wow. Yeah. You can all do listen rolls. I'll do what? Ah. Listen. Listen. Extreme. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. 84. I ain't hearing a thing. My all the gunfire. I should. That's right. <laughs> oh, two. Well, perhaps because of the proximity that you happen to be, those of you who passed can hear it whisper. It's as if it's reciting some sort of spell or incantation. It's quiet, but kind of hurts your ears just a little bit to hear it. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll assume that you all go to sleep, wake up the next morning. Uh, the professor serves a uh, uh, light continental sort of breakfast, not, not a really big thing. Um, by the way, you can see this is before he met uh, James Meadows. He's not, he's not mentioned at all in the story. Um, uh, after uh, an hour or so, uh, he gets a postcard back. He's excellent. I've gotten a postcard back already. Uh, good man. Ah, thank you. Ah, Monday, August 7th, 1893, to Professor Smythe. Fez is very dangerous, impossible to destroy. Yeah, we realize that. On no account, wear it have trusted allies bring it by all speed to Constantinople. We'll use what knowledge I have to destroy it. Warn them in no uncertain terms, their lives may be at peril. I will meet them at Circesi Station, Demir. Oh, my friends, the fastest way to get to uh, Constantinople is the Orient Express. <laughs> so, uh, Tickets are rather expensive, but uh, I have... Oh, uh, my family will take care of the bill. It is, it is oh, all but done. We, uh, I've, I've also sent a telegram to a, another gentleman who is an expert on uh, these sort of uh, ancient Persian things. Um, uh, his name is uh, Baron Leopold von Hoffler. Uh, he's uh, in uh, Vienna. Oh. He'll meet you there. He's Austrian. Uh, he would like very much to assist. I can't go with you. 
Now, I know a lot of you have known that uh, before I met you, I was already heavily into some of the uh, occult studies. And unfortunately, I've already traveled in that direction. That's how I know Demir so well. Uh, We've had our own little adventures, uh, one of which uh, got me into some serious trouble. Uh, There are evil cults throughout the world, and there is a cult in Constantinople, um, a very dangerous man. Uh, He's called Suleiman the Red. Uh, At the time, he was trying, like this, uh, this Lottie fellow, to create some sort of cult, and I uh, opposed him quite, uh, quite effectively. Unfortunately, Demir says that if I try to come back into that area, I'm a dead man. <coughs> so I can't, I can't travel to Constantinople with you, but we can keep in touch via telegram. Yeah, uh, duh, it's a lot duh. to ask of you. It will be honor for us to make this journey for you. Uh, this has to be destroyed. Given the evident danger this thing offers, the grotesque effect that we saw it have, and the fact that we can't obviously get limited it in natural ways, uh, very well. The soonest I can get you on the train is Wednesday. So yeah. you have until you have tomorrow and then Wednesday. Perfect. Which should give you some time to do some research. Mm-hmm. And uh, purchase firearms. Yes. Mm, yes. Procure various useful devices, well, including something very heavily iron in which to put the damned thing. Yes. Iron box for hot. <laughs> we don't know what we're up against, so be very careful who you talk to. You trust us to marry him implicitly? Of course. Yes, he's a very good man. He believes this... in goodness. And this is definitely something very evil that's afoot. Hmm. And this head in Leopold. his head. I'm sorry. Baron Leopold. Smythe, have you ever yes. had dealings with him before? I've dealt with him quite a bit. He's quite the scholar, quite intelligent, um, uh, uh, impeccable man, a very good man, very good man. Yes, uh, you mm-hmm. should be able to uh, rendezvous with him in Austria. Excellent. <laughs> and with that, I think that's where we will call it close for this evening. The next one will be you guys traveling on the, well, doing research and then traveling on the Orient Express. Hmm, that trade comes up a lot. <laughs> Imagine that. Our players included Morgan Llewellyn, David Gassaway, Stuart Lively, Keith Craig, Josh Harwood, and John Hook, with yours truly as the Keeper of the Secrets. We have a Discord server where you can chat with other members. You can set up private games and you can learn the finer arts of gameplay and game mastery. We provide audio-only versions of our shows free for you to download from Podbean or iTunes. If you'd like to support our show, please visit our Patreon account. It's a dollar to a month. It helps us a lot. <coughs> Excuse me. Like, share, and subscribe to our channel and punch the bell icon for updates on our latest shows. And leave us some comments. We enjoy reading them and answer any questions you might have. This is Tom Rayleigh, together with all the members of our gaming club, inviting you to journey with us once again into the darkness for another adventure into the universe of H.P. Lovecraft and the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. Until next time, good luck and good gaming.